I had like a printed zine, but it never really clicked. And so I got frustrated and I said, you know, it's too complicated. There's too many classes. All the classes have different things they're doing. I have to worry about leveling up and the power curve and this new system. I should scale everything back to where it fits on a single page. And I should test that page and see if that page works. And that's when I had sort of had this idea that I was calling Mothership about what if you were just playing astronauts who were exploring a huge mega dungeon that was like an alien mothership. You're listening to The Lost Bay Podcast, a show about and with indie tabletop RPG designers and artists. I'm Iko. The Last Bay Podcast is supported by its patrons. A big shout out to two new patrons, Ben Lawrence and Chris Stagno. Thanks so much, folks, for supporting the show and helping it grow. You can become a patron too. Just head to patreon.com slash thelostbay. I've put the link in the show notes. Today my guest is Sean McCoy, designer of the sci-fi horror RPG Mothership. In Mothership you play as a blue-collar worker, a marine, a scientist, an android or a teamster. You were sent somewhere at the fringes of the universe and of course you stumble across unspeakable horror. During the whole month of November there's an awesome Kickstarter running for the boxed set edition of the game. Mothership is becoming an iconic game, redefining the sci-fi horror RPG genre. But its author, Sean McCoy, was preparing himself for a very different career. How did you start playing RPGs? So when I was a kid, I had this family friend named Brian Pope. Uh, he was a friend of my father's. Brian Pope is actually the president of the company today known as Arcane Wonders, a board game company. You know, me and his kids were friends. We all went to church together. He had made this game called Legendary Heroes, which he had printed out himself at home. I think it was actually a D100 system. He had written all these splat books for it. You could be any class, any race. He had tons of magic stuff. And that was actually the first role-playing game I ever played. I played it before Dungeons and Dragons or anything like that. So my first interaction with RPGs was as a game you made yourself. I was probably seven or eight, something like that. Wow, super young. Yeah, very young. I have these great memories of being up until three or four o'clock in the morning with all my cousins who are mostly older than me, yelling and screaming, you know, uh, Brian's wife, Monica, my aunt Monica at the time, coming up and telling us to be quiet, that sort of thing. And then taking home these books that he had printed and bound himself and just pouring over the pages, trying to construct that sort of perfect character. It was really amazing. So do you remember what was the thing about playing RPGs that you liked the most when you first started? What was really incredible about Legendary Heroes that really grabbed me, it was kind of like GURPS or Rifts, where there was so much material. He had a martial arts book, he had a psionics book, he had each school of magic, like necromancy, evocation or whatever, had its own book. There were dozens of races. And so as a kid, you know, I couldn't spend most of my time playing. It was going to be very rare that we got to play. So I could pour over the books, right? And so I could say, oh, I'm going to pick these skills and this magic. And just imagining the kind of character that I would create was what was so intriguing to me. And I, I, it's, it's very different from where I've ended up now, but I still remember very clearly just how fun it was to think, oh, what if I made a, a monk? What if I made a necromancer? And then growing up, what happened? Did you continue to play consistently or? After that, I went through a long dry spell. I think because of church, there was a sort of family aversion to gaming. And it wasn't until high school that I started to look at RPGs again, specifically after Diablo 2 came out. I sort of begged my parents to let me get a copy as long as I promised I wouldn't play the Necromancer. <laughs> okay. There was this Diablo 2 box set version of Dungeons and Dragons. And you played like a Dungeons and Dragons game, but set in the Diablo 2 sort of world. And he invited us over and we started playing with that. And we were like, you know, there's a real game, there's a bigger game. Um, called Dungeons and Dragons, we should get that. And so me and my friends, Nick and Andy, started collecting the player's guide and the Dungeon Master's guide, you know, each of us buying one of the books that we could afford and sharing them. My cousin Ryan started coming over and, and running games for us, really, really difficult games. And that was sort of my introduction into the broader 
hobby. And from there, when I got to college, I met a bunch of people who were really into the Forge and indie games. And we played stuff like the Mountain Witch and Shovel Harry Roach and all that sort of stuff. And I sort of realized that there was this whole world of RPGs that I'd never heard of. We took a road trip with those friends to Origins. It was the first convention I ever went to. We drove to Columbus, Ohio from Austin, Texas, which was like a 14-hour drive. Oh, wow. All of us like taking turns. We'd never driven that far before. And that was sort of that like, oh my God, this is whole world. There's RPGs everywhere. They don't have to just be D&D. That was sort of that moment for me. You're mentioning college friends. So I was wondering, what did you study in college? From a very early age, film was my passion. So I wanted to be a filmmaker. I went to a community college down in Austin and kind of just dicked around. I took like some life drawing classes and I tried to work on a couple of prerequisites, but I dropped out really quick. But by the time I was 21, me and my friends put together a feature film. It was a full length film and I directed it and we raised money. You know, we had about 50 people working on it. And they gave me this idea that you could build something yourself and that you could get people together and you could really make something much, much bigger than yourself. And so all throughout sort of college and after college, I sort of pursued that. And then eventually I was back in Dallas. I was working at Starbucks for my now uh, wife, who's my manager at the time. And I was uh, writing a screenplay and I was working on getting funding and I'd put all this energy into making this movie. And then everything fell through. The funding fell through, the cast fell through, the crew fell through. So this had been my sort of dream for five or six years, maybe even longer. And I had no idea idea what I was going to do it. And I was just devastated. So I had this huge sort of identity crisis. And, you know, I went back to work at Starbucks and then Brian Pope, that guy I'd mentioned before who had got me into RPGs, uh, hired me to work at Arcane Wonders, his company. He didn't have any employees, but he was working on his flagship game, Mage Wars. And that's when I started getting into the board game industry. I started going back to conventions for the first time since college. I started getting to know who was who in the industry and how a game got made. And I sort of got my education in board games after this very long break from the gaming industry in general, just because I needed some somewhere creatively to go that wasn't film related. So you've been talking about your passion for film and filmmaking, and I was wondering if behind Mothership there were cinematic influences. What film might have influenced the work on Mothership? How does cinema inform maybe the way you thought about the game? The big cinematic influences for Mothership are, of course, movies like Alien, Aliens, The Thing, Event Horizon. Those are the big, big touchstones that I think are very obvious to a lot of people on first reading of it. But the real sort of influences came into both how we approach Mothership sort of like filmmaking and some of these deeper cuts like there is this uh, horror author named Brian Evenson who wrote this short story called The Dust in his collection A Collapse of Horses. And it's about these astronauts working on this mining station and the dust from the mines is getting into them and sort of making them hallucinate. And it made me sort of see sci-fi horror with a new lens. And that sort of helped glue things like Alien, Aliens, The Thing together together and start really ticking my brain around it. But additionally, in film, you want all the details to work together. You want the lighting to work together with the cinematography, to work together with the sound and the performances and the script. And that attitude carried over into how we produce RPGs. So we wanted, you know, the graphic design and the writing and the product itself and what the scenario was and what the rules were to all sort of work together to reinforce the theme and reinforce the setting and that sort of stuff. It's not just the writer writes it independently and they give it to the graphic designer and they independently just lay out the words. They send it to the illustrator. They just put in images to fill in the blanks. They all have to sort of be managed and brought together like a concert or a film so that each element sort of builds on the last one. All these little details matter. Let's talk now about mothership, about its creation process. How did it work, you know, especially in the beginning? How did you start working on it? Was it like a gradual process or? At Tuesday Night Games, uh, the company that I co-own with Alan Girding, we uh, were famous for making social deduction party games like Two Rooms and a Boom. So we had made Two Rooms and a Boom, we had kickstarted that, we had done really well, and that sort of had given us a chance to do this more full-time. We came up with another game, World Championship Russian Roulette, 
And we'd been going to these conventions and we were starting to get the hint. You couldn't show up at these conventions without new product. We were showing up with old copies of Terms of the Movement. Although they were selling, people were passing us by because there was nothing new to see. I had been working for a long time on trying to get a role-playing game up and running. I had been reading all the OSR blogs and I really wanted to be a part of that scene, but I didn't want to make something fantasy-based. I was working on something cyberpunk. I was working on a game that I called Null Hack, and I'd really been stuck because I wanted to create this whole system from scratch, and cyberpunk was such a big genre to me. It had to be like Blade Runner, but it also had to be like Akira, and it also had to be like Neuromancer, and you know, it had to appeal to Shadowrun characters, and it was all these sort of different things on top of a new system, and so I put together this zine, and it had all the different classes, all the different class abilities, all the ways you could level up, and none of it really fit together at all. It was all just kind of like filler material. And I tried to run an adventure for my business partner. It just fell flat. I didn't really have an adventure. I felt really frustrated and stuck. And so what I did was... But did you like distribute the zine or... No, it all stayed internal. I had like a printed zine, but it never really clicked. And so I got frustrated and I said, you know, it's too complicated. There's too many classes. All the classes have different things they're doing. I have to worry about leveling up and the power curve and this new system. I should scale everything back to where it fits on a single page. And I should test that page and see if that page works. And that's when I had sort of had this idea that I was calling Mothership about what if you were just playing astronauts who were exploring a huge mega dungeon that was like an alien mothership, right? And I worked on this pocket mod, this foldable piece of paper that was all the rules you needed to play on one sheet of paper. You could still find it on my blog. I would use a dead simple D100 system. In fact, I wasn't even going to worry too much about the system. I was just going to get the game to the table and see if it worked. And if it worked, I was going to iterate on it from there. And I took it to Gen Con. I think it was Gen Con 2017. And I played it. I played a session and it worked. And that was the amazing thing for me was that RPGs no longer felt like a total mystery. They now felt like you could write one if you stuck to the basics. And if you played it and it worked, you had something, right? And so over the next year, I started noodling around with this idea that I should expand what I had into a small zine like Traveler or original Dungeons and Dragons. So about one year later, the convention Origins was coming up. And at Tuesday Night Games, Sean's company, they didn't have again a new product to bring to the convention. And this is when Sean thought he might bring his own game, Mothership, to the Origins convention. I just banged out this 48-page zine. I was like, I'll do all the illustration, I'll do all the graphic design, I'll do all the writing so that it doesn't cost us anything. Jarrett Crater, our editor, had gotten a hold of the pocket mod before and, and really loved it and really was like, this is amazing. I want to be a part of this. So I sent it to him. And then I'd been talking to Fiona Geist over G Plus and Don Stroud, who had introduced me to the OSR. And they started giving feedback and notes. Fiona loved it. And she said, you know, I want to write these this trinket, and this patch table. I really want something that will sort of make your characters come alive. She wrote those up for me. Don was giving advice and cheerleading along the way. We printed up 50 copies. And the turning point was Google Plus was still big in the OSR. This was about 2018. And we brought it to the booth. And our booth was very light and breezy, big, bold, primary colors. And we had a few copies of this Mothership book in the back. And this whole different crowd of people started coming up to us, these role-playing game horror fan people. They'd say, hey, I'm looking for that Mothership game here. And we were like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we've got a copy. And they'd say, uh, do you guys have any modules or just a rule book? Just a rule for now you know but you can make your own stuff and we sold out so you sold out all the 50 copies at your booth at the convention right yes exactly yeah it was huge and so that's sort of how it came to be was we realized okay we we have something here we have to follow this up with a module we have to follow this up with an adventure and so that was at origins and we had six weeks until gen con and so don fiona Jarrett, and i said okay we're going to make a module called dead planet we've got six weeks to go let's apply everything we've learned and 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 hammer this out and so for the next six weeks we uh we worked on dead planet and nothing else and it was wild and kind of insane and, and uh, frustrating at times just how quickly things were going. But we really had the sense that we had something very, very incredible there and that we had to get it done so that this sort of game could take off. Because we realized without a module, um, without an adventure, nobody was going to invent one for us. Even if it was a great system, it was just way too much to ask people 
to try this untested system, no adventures, no promise of what the game could be like, you know. So what strikes me is that at this first convention, there's a lot of people from the community showing up to buy the game, people who have discovered the game on Google+. Mothership has clearly a very strong and creative community. And I was wondering, is that something that just happened or did you work towards it? Community has always been huge for Mothership. And I think a big part of that was Early on, we recognized that the community is what makes the game last a long time. In particular, we took a look at the OSR. The whole OSR was built around out-of-print, dead versions of Dungeons & Dragons, right? The company, you know, TSR wasn't around anymore, and these games weren't in print. So it was the community that kept coming up with the new content and the blogs and and breathed new life into these sort of dead games like BX or, or OD&D or AD&D and that sort of thing. And so I think that had been in my head that for Mothership to grow long term, what was more important than the products was that there were people who were blogging and people who were coming up with their own content. And it needed to be really easy to come up with your own third party content because that's what the OSR was. So Mothership needed that. At the time, we had started on Google+, but Google+, shut down very, very rapidly at the beginning of Mothership's life. And we moved very quickly over to Discord people started popping in and it was crazy at the beginning it was just a dozen two dozen people but there was this idea they were making you know d10 lists in our hive mind channel and generating this sort of content and this idea of you know we called gygaxian democracy in the osr of of the the community sort of generating its own content was really really appealing to me we made our third party license very easy and very open right from the beginning so people started writing for it and then as it's grown we've worked really hard to particularly encourage third party publishers We work with third-party publishers to get them what they need if they need marketing help. For smaller projects, we've even pre-ordered copies for our stores so they could have enough money to print a print run. And so I think that's helped a lot, but it's always been a sort of focus. The big thing has been support. We're always talking about how are you going to support this game going forward? Because the success of a game isn't in the system, it's in the support. It's in the long-term adventures, modules, organized play, community that you build around the game. There's a couple different models for how publishers handle this. One of the models that you see a lot more in the sort of indie story game scene is to build a system and move on. Clever system, publish it, move on. Next clever system, publish it, move on. And so the designer gets a reputation for being a good designer, but the games don't necessarily have a lot of adventures put out for it or have a lot of support for it. So we're always talking about, okay, this system is great. The setting is great. How do you see modules playing out over time? How do you see building a community of fan base around this game over time? So that has become, because of the success of Mothership, very important to how we design not just the games, but the game line and how we're going to approach any future games we come up with is how can you build a community around this and how can you support that community? Let's talk about the design of the game. There's something at the core of Mothership that feels really important to me, it's money, it's finances. In the game, there's basically a price tag on everything, on the things you can buy, but also on yourself. You work for a company, you have a certain value. I feel that somehow this financial aspect could be somehow a part of the sci-fi horror itself. Does that make sense? I think the economic horror is very much part of the sort of politics of the mothership setting, um, particularly in stuff like A Pound of Flesh, where, you know, you're even paying money to, to breathe on the space station. We take that implied setting of late stage capitalism gone amok very seriously. And, you know, I look at some of the games that I love, like Traveler. Traveler has this libertarian utopia. Things cost a lot of money. There's a mortgage on your ship, but you own a ship and it's sort of like the Wild West. And you've got these empires and these imperials, you know, these different huge governments fighting. um, And you're out there sort of like firefly on the edge of society, but you're sort of making it. And Mothership, in a lot of ways, is the reverse of that. The war is over. The company's won. If you're a small crew, then you're just freelance contractors working for some mega corporation. The company's your principal hirer, firer, enemy friend. It's so ubiquitous that it's hard to escape. I read this great 
series on the blog Against the Wicked City about Warhammer fantasy roleplay and what is really going on in that game. And it's about there's this time of great change during the Renaissance and, and you know, the nobility is sort of falling and merchants are sort of making their way into the nobility for the first time. And that the only people who are able to see the horrors of this massive change in society are the people on the edge, the people on the fringe. And that really resonated with me. And that is similar to what's going on in Mothership, where the corporations are over and there's this promise of these off-world colonies to people living in these overcrowded habitation worlds that are sort of these cyberpunk dystopias themselves. That promise of this colony life is a lie. You know, entire jump ships are going lost in space. Colonies are breaking down, you know, and the colonial governments, and the corporations are barely keeping it together. There's a small percentage of people who are actually living up to the promise of the new utopic world with all its bounty, but it's at the expense of the people who are out on the rim doing all that asteroid mining. And the players are those people, those blue collar workers out on the rim, the only people who are far away enough from society to see what's really going on, but still tethered to the corporation, you know, because it's the only work you can find. And those people are the people who like fit in the cracks. So Mothership has a very strong implied setting. It's almost like if the universe of Mothership had its own mechanics that then translate into game mechanics. Like the universe has a strong vibe, but it's not precise. You didn't choose to close, you know, I don't know, specifying a number of solar systems, a number of planets, and you left it very open. How did you decide to structure the game and the game universe like this? I'm glad you have connected with it in that way. I think this is, again, that, that sort of thing from the beginning. I was thinking about we wanted Mothership to get big, to a large game with a large fan base. And we knew every piece of lore that you'd have to remember, every piece of canon that would decrease your player pool. <laughs> For Mothership, we had this idea that sci-fi horror had an implied setting that people, for the most part, intuitively understood because movies like Alien and Aliens had really developed this sort of setting in the background and that as a genre, it really was really underserved in the market. So with fantasy games, if you sit down at a table with four or five people and you say, okay, we're playing a fantasy game and there's uh, elves and dwarves and, you know, wizards and that sort of stuff and the rest, you know, you'll figure it as you go along. People have seen Lord of the Rings and they've taken in fantasy media for a long time. And so even though there might be specific rules to your universe about how magic works or, or what elves are, the players at your table have a pretty common understanding of the genre and the setting and the expectations. And when we started working on Mothership, we believed that that would also be true for sci-fi horror, but that it hadn't really shown up in a lot of RPGs yet. The big fear for Wardens is sci-fi, everyone wants to know, how does the technology work? And what if I don't understand the science? And so by leaving all that open and not describing it, we've tried to basically cut that question off at the pass and say, at your table, your jump drives work however you want. If you're really hard sci-fi and don't want them to work at all, or you have specific ways that you talk about how hyperspace travel works, that's great. All we really care about is that it can malfunction and go wrong. And that's sort of why we've worked very hard to keep this implied setting without any canon or lore for the game itself. And it's something we push back a lot internally all the time. We had these ships that we were working on our new ship book, and we thought about what if ships had manufacturers? And you picked from a list of these 10 manufacturers, and those manufacturers gave your ship different bonuses. And then there was a big pushback about, well, if you do that, aren't those manufacturers canon? Aren't they now like manufacturers that are going to show up in the modules? And don't you need to know who they are? And we said, you know, it's kind of like lore, but it's not important lore. Yeah, but if you give an inch, it's going to happen every single time. You're going to be referencing back the manufacturer in the core rule book, those will feel more official. And so we have this huge push pull all the time internally about where our level of canon and lore sits and what is inspirational to wardens and they can take and run with and what is constricting to wardens and is something they feel like they need to learn in order to play the game. And yeah, you're right. Before Mothership showing up, there wasn't much sci-fi horror in the RPG space. But somehow I feel that there wasn't any more so much sci-fi horror in the popular culture. It was very strong in the 80s and 90s and maybe even in the 70s with like 
uh, Kubrick's 2001 movie, it's almost like some kind of like transcendental sci-fi horror. But in the last two decades, it hasn't been so strong. So I feel like maybe Mothership is bringing back to us like a genre somehow in hibernation for a, a couple of decades or so. Does that make sense? I think sci-fi horror, it's like a cult classic subgenre. You know, cyberpunk has gotten very, very big and very ubiquitous uh, with large, you know, game franchises and also just how technology intersects with the way we live today. It feels like we're living in a cyberpunk dystopia. So cyberpunk was this small cult genre for a while, but it's really become very mainstream. I think a lot of sci-fi horror fans like myself, you know, for a long time, we're very much starving for long-term support for for this kind of game in, in their world. And it's it's becoming popular again, you know, uh, with Fox selling to Disney, there's going to be a new Aliens show. So I think we're entering into a new sort of era of sci-fi horror being in the more cultural mainstream, you know, certainly in games, but also in cinema as well. It's an underserved genre. And I think in RPGs, just from a business perspective, you want to be looking for underserved genres that have a rabid community, but have no outlet for it. You know, there is more money in fantasy for sure, but it's an overserved market. There's plenty of fantasy games to the point where they're commodities. You can just switch them out sort of haphazardly. But if you can find a genre that nobody's really doing and nobody's really doing right, you have huge potential there. So to confront this sci-fi horror in Mothership, you can play four classes. You can be a scientist, an android, a marine or a teamster. The character creation process is quite unique. The character sheet looks like a flowchart and all the rules, all the info you need to build your character is actually written on the very character sheet itself. Here is Sean about that. So with the Mothership character sheet, what was really important to me and, and continues to be important to me is that the books, all the components that we give you are sort of your physical interface with the game. And so it's important that you're able to reference them quickly and easily. We use the interior covers. We use the back covers of our books to make them easy to reference. Character sheet, though, is that one physical interface that the players have with the sort of game. That's the thing they get to fill out. I loved filling out character sheets as a kid, filling in all the little boxes, that sort of thing. But additionally, we have this concept called time to table that we talk about um, when we make board games or role playing games, which is of all the art forms, board games and role playing games take the longest to start enjoying songs and paintings and, and even reading and, and film, they're all, in a certain sense, very passive in that you can just let them wash over you. A but a game, somebody has to go read the rules, then they have to teach everybody the rules. Then, like in a board game, you have to play a couple times before you get good. And all of this time it takes from the time you buy the game to the time you get to the table and you can start playing. And we want to reduce as much as possible, particularly for new games. I think for D&D, &D, you can have this very long time to table because it's so established, people are willing to put up with it. But for a new game that wants to break in, we had to make it very easy to get into the game and start playing. And so for Mothership, that combined with the fact that it's a very lethal game, it's a very deadly game, meant that character creation couldn't be something where you had to look up a bunch of feats and sort of calculate a bunch of stuff. If the rules weren't on the character sheet and your character died and it was like, hey, I need the rule book and we only have this one copy of the zine, it was just going to kill a session right in the middle of the game. You needed to be able to just hand them a new character sheet and be like, cool, see you in five minutes, we'll get back to playing and go. It has also ended up being this weird marketing tool to where by doing sort of that, you know, it's something that people talk about a lot. And in the box that we've updated the old flowchart character sheet to a new flowchart character sheet, that's a lot simpler and maybe even less iconic. But again, it's it's reduced that time to table. It's reduced that time for people to learn the game, which we're, we're still very proud of. Another very unique feature about Mothership is that several adventure models, official ones as well as third party ones, come with audio accessories. Audio files the warden or game master can use at the table and play at the table during a game. So sci-fi has this ability to make use of a lot of technology today, and it's a huge part of the genre. So if you watch Alien or Aliens, you'll hear these distress calls or these recordings all the time as these sort of warnings to not go down to this planet or not go on the ship or whatever. And if you have an audio recording in a fantasy game, it sort of throws everybody out of whack. But in a sci-fi game, if I say, okay, and then you hear this and I hit play and, and you hear this distress signal, this garbled, staticky distress signal, it really resonates with people. It really draws them in and immerses them in the universe. And we had Donald Schultz, a good friend 
friend of mine is a, a voiceover director or was for a very long time. He works at Plat Hat Games now. So he helped set us up with a lot of distress signals and that kind of thing. It just sort of continued to make sense for us. In fact, one of the stretch goals we have is to turn all the snippets from the monster book into audio recordings. So again, you can play them live at your table. And by sort of setting that tone, third party publishers picked up on that. So yeah, audio recordings are huge. We want to keep supporting that forever and ever and ever. I think it's just something so fun when players get props and props are hard to make, especially if you're not a graphic designer, but anybody can record audio. You can record audio on your phone. You can have a friend read it out. So I really encourage people to try it. But also we wanted to give those tools because I think there's a magical moment when they've been digging, 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 and then they open a locker and they find some tape recorder and they hit play and you actually hit play. The players light up and they're transported. And that's just so fun. Yeah. And listen, uh, talking about props, uh, uh, do I remember correctly for the first backers of the Kickstarter campaign, there would be patches, right? To peek behind the curtain a little bit for indie creators on Kickstarter or for any creators, the first 24 to 48 hours are the most important in your campaign. You will see 80, even sometimes 90% of your pledges on that first day. And then you hit this long middle where it bottoms out and then you get a small bump at the very end. But hitting that number on the first day is crazy important. And so we're putting everything we have into this and we want the game to be successful. So to incentivize backers, we're giving out this free sort of limited edition launch crew patch. So you'll be a launch crew for the first official ever box set for Mothership if you back at a physical tier. And it's it's weird. As we get bigger, we learn these different sides of the business. And, you know, we talk to Backer Kit. They've been doing a lot of marketing. We've been teaming up with them. And we just learn these new things day one, day one, day one. That's huge for us. And so that's why we do that stuff. It's not to, like, lock people out. It's really just to ensure that we have a great first day. So let's talk about the box set and the Kickstarter campaign. First of all, it's so cool that you're making a box set. There aren't many box set products in the OSR, post-OSR, or indie scene. So what's in it? What's in the box set? So sitting next to me is like the Traveler box set and the Odin D box set. And I see Call of Cthulhu and Pendragon on my shelf as well. And to me, there was sort of this magical thinking element where I said, okay, what I'll do is I'll follow in the footsteps of the games that I loved. And they start with these zines, these soft cover zines. They put them in boxes, you know, from there, then they go into their advanced phase where they go into hard covers and that sort of stuff. And that really lines up really well with a company because at each of those stages, it gets more and more expensive, but you could sort of gauge the market and demand before you move on to the next one. So the first copy of Mothership, that very first zine was explicitly made with the idea that it would be in a box someday. It's why we've never made the jump to hardcovers yet. It's because I wanted to fulfill that promise that I'd made to sort of myself that this would be ultimately in its final form in a box. And then eventually we can move on to, you know, Mothership Advanced or or whatever and and move into the hardcovers. But this version, I wanted to sit on the shelf next to Traveler and, and Dungeons and Dragons and Call of Cthulhu and these other games. It's a similar size. We've got two versions. There's the core set, which is going to have the player survival guide, which is updated, new art. It's been rewritten to be easier to explain. The rules have been streamlined, but also for the first time ever, a warden's guide, the warden's operations manual, which is our sort of version of the dungeon master's guide. And we've taken a different lens to that. A lot of DM's guides are a ton of optional rules and sometimes advice, but we took it from more of a board game stance. It's in three sections. Prep your first session, run your first session, prep your campaign. Basically, the idea is if you're opening up the book, we dive immediately into, okay, call your friends. You're going to play in a week. Let's make a session and let's go. Because that's sort of the stuff that I wanted when I started playing RPGs was somebody to really hold my hand, not just because I needed the basics, but somebody who was going to say, okay, if you want to set up a hex crawl, here's what you do. Then it'll have a monster book, which we're calling Unconfirmed Contact Reports. Our big thing with that is not just a bunch of stat blocks and descriptions, but instead each horror has what we call snippets. And these are in-world descriptions of the monster, whether they're corporate reports and memos or lab reports or rumors. These are quotes that you can give to your players as clues or things they find. So it'll have those three books as well as a percentile dice. And then we've switched over to using what we call the panic die, which is a D20 that you only roll for panic checks. It's a bad die. You don't want to roll it. That will all come in the box set. And then we have a deluxe box, which is twice as big and also includes a pound of flesh, dead planet and gradient descent in it as well. So you can get everything from the first edition to one box to sort of make my dream box at the whole game in one box, all the little toys and trinkets that you need to play.
That was Sean McCoy, designer of the horror sci-fi RPG Mothership. The Kickstarter for the Mothership box set is running throughout the whole month of November 2021. And the good news is that the campaign has already hit so many stretch goals, so many stretch goals, it's going to be an awesome box set. And of course, I've put the link to the Kickstarter page in the show notes. You've listened to the Lost Bay podcast, a show about and with indie tabletop designers and artists. It's produced by me, Ico, and music is by Avery Isles. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider supporting it and help me to grow it and give voice to amazing RPG designers and artists. I'll put a link to the Lost Bay podcast Patreon page in the show notes. The Lost Bay podcast episodes are also available on YouTube with English subtitles. Thanks a lot for listening and until next time, stay well.